I want to talk a little bit about that this morning. We've been talking to, we've been walking through this series called What's Next and really just uh, taking a look at what, what it looks like to take a next step in your faith and, and what that looks like. We've talked about you move from believing into following and then you move from following into community. And, and, and this morning, I, th- I really think that the, most, uh, the first, two thing, first two weeks I talked about was really just about your individual relationship with Christ, what that looks like this way. And so last week and this week, I think, are some of the most important things that you can do as a believer if you are in this. And, and if you're here this morning and you're, you said, you know, I'm, you're still trying to figure out what it means to follow Christ, maybe you haven't made that decision to do so yet, and that's okay. We're just going to let you peek behind the curtain and tell you what we think is, is important for us as believers, those of us who have believed and those of us who have made that decision to follow Christ and have been baptized. We want to know what that looks like. I think the two most important things that, that we talk about in the Christian faith are what we talked about last week. I think building community. Uh, getting into a group, and there's still time to do that today. I want to allow you some time to do that. If you've not signed up or have not connected into uh, some kind of a grow group or a life group where you're going to do life with people, you need to find it. Get with me. Come to mine. I will help you get connected. Talk to Pastor Mark. One of us will help you get connected into a life group that will help walk you through that. I think the second thing, and one of the things that we do around here every year is we have this Say Yes campaign where we look at uh, we try to get you to say yes to serving because I think serving is an area that will grow you f- in your faith more than anything else. I think that you know you can get together and we can have a Bible study and we can talk and you will experience some growth in that. But uh, there will be nothing that will that will grow you as an individual or grow you as a follower of Jesus Christ like serving. And so um, have you ever uh, have you ever had like a monumental task that you've been faced with that um, I don't know it was some kind of a job that you got when you were a kid or something that you were faced with and uh, you, you looked at it and thought, oh my word, I will never accomplish this on my own. I remember when we were kids, my, uh, my parents, uh, my dad somehow, I don't know where it came from, but I'm not kidding you. I'm not exaggerating. I, it, I, there, he got like a dump truck load, uh, like a tandem dump truck load of corn, like sweet corn. At least it seemed that way to me. And so that morning, we got up. It was a Saturday morning. My mom woke Farron and I up early and said, hey, boys, dad's got a job for you. And so he took us, and they had gotten this corn. It was in the basement. Literally, it was a heaping pile of sweet corn. And our job for the day was to shuck that corn all day long until our fingers bled. (laughs) To the bone, we shucked corn. And if there was ever anything that I was longing to hear in that moment was someone, anyone, a live, breathing body to show up and say, how can I help? (laughs) Right? How can I help? I would have said, get some corn and start shucking. We shuck corn for days. I hate shucking corn. But we just shucked and shucked and shucked corn, and and it was just miserable. And so in that moment, though, I was just would have died for somebody to say, hey, how can I help? What can I do? So this morning, I want you guys just to play along this morning. When you do church, it kind of feels that way. It's like you were just, as a pastor, you're waiting for somebody to step forward and say, hey, how can I help, right? How can I get involved? How can I get? So this morning, I would just like you to ask me that question. Even if you, if, if, if you, don't, if you don't know, even if you don't want to, I just want you to pretend and just say, what can we do? So all together on three, Trent, what can we do? One, two, three. Trent, what can we do? Thank you for asking. I appreciate it. <laughs> Here's the things that we, I think we have to do as a church if we are going to continue to be the church in this community. The first thing is we have to do some things as a church for us to have the kind of church that we enjoy attending. Now, this is probably the least most important one, I think. But in order to do some things, in order to continue to worship in this place, in order to continue to be the kind of church that we are, we all have to do some things as a church for us to have the kind of church that we enjoy worshiping in, don't we? Uh, The second thing, like I said, that's probably the least most important. The second thing is we need to do 
we need to do it so it continues to be a place that's easy for you to invite people. We have to do some things around here so it's easy for you to invite your friends. Like we want to be the kind of church that when you go out to your friends and people who know nothing about Jesus and people who are nothing like Jesus, but you feel comfortable saying, hey, why don't you come to my church because you belong here and we're the kind of church. We've got to do some things that requires us to be a certain way here at church. So we, we have to do some things to continue to be the kind of church that you are comfortable Comfortable inviting your friends to because we want you to be able to invite your friends here. Um, we have this responsibility. The third thing that we do is we have a responsibility to our world and our community. We have some kind of an influence that we have. We have a responsibility to the community of Salem and the surrounding areas. Like, uh, and I'm not going to name them because I got in trouble because I missed one, like Patoka or Fryna or I missed one of you guys. I don't know. But we have this responsibility. We have an opportunity. And the fourth thing is we have an opportunity to influence people in and around our community. And we have to do that. So the relationship between church and community dates all the way back uh, to 400 B.C. And, and in, in a story about Nehemiah. And if, you've, if, you, if you go into your Bible and you look and you'll find a book called Nehemiah. And I want to tell you a little bit about who Nehemiah, Nehemiah, if you don't know who Nehemiah was, uh, he was a Jew, he grew up in Jerusalem, and he was a Jew, but he'd uh, become a cupbearer to the king of Xerxes in 445 to 465 BC. And so he got this job working for the king, really kind of a, uh, an interesting job. Uh, Nehemiah's job, if you don't know anything about Nehemiah, he was a cupbearer bearer to the king. Now, if you don't know what a cup bearer to the king was, basically, it was the guy that would test the food and drink the wine before the king did in case there was poison in it. He would die and not the king. He was that, so it was that kind of a job. Woohoo! I'm a cup bearer. <laughs> I get to teach the poison, you know? So it was really kind of, he really uh, was excited about his new role, but it took him 150 miles away from his hometown of Jerusalem in what we know now as Iran. And so here, in this moment, Nehemiah has been serving the king, and he's been, you know, testing the wine, and, and he's in very, very close proximity to the king. Because of the nature of his job, he would, have, he would have been very, very close proximity to the king. He would have seen him on a regular basis. He would have had some kind of relationship with this king, Exer I can't even say it, Exerces. I'm probably butchering that. Somebody help me out after church. I'm sure you'll correct me. But anyway... <laughs> but he had this influence and so here's the thing I think the first thing that we have to do if we're going to be any kind of an influence into, into the lives of children into the lives of people that come to here into the lives of you if you're a visitor if we're going to try to be any kind of influence if we're going to be worth our salt in this community and in our world and, and if, if we are going to change the image that our culture has about Christians and about followers or believers of Jesus Christ we are going to have to do some things and I believe the, thing, the first thing that we, we have to do, which is exactly what Nehemiah did, is he is going to have to see a need. And so he's serving as, as, the, king, as the king's cupbearer, and his brother makes a trip from Iran to, to, and, and tells Nehemiah, hey, kind of gives him an update on his hometown. Like when, I don't know if you, like you grew up in Salem and you moved away, it'd be like somebody coming and going, man, you would not believe what happened in Salem, man. It's a wreck. It's a mess. You know, uh, and so here's what his brother said was basically, hey, we've been, a Jerusalem had been attacked. The walls around the city in those days, uh, cities had walls around them. And it was very, very, it was really kind of interesting um, uh, understanding of these walls. In those days, communities and cities were surrounded by walls. And, the, the, and then inside the wall was the city and the temple and the place of worship. And it, it, it's interesting because there's this parallel between the temple might seem to be this religious institution, but the walls are kind of this secular one. And both are sacred and, and, and are secular. We're both sacred and secular were necessary to fulfill God's plan. And so if, to understand about a wall, without a wall, 
The city in ancient Near East was, it, it would not have been safe from bandits. It, gangs and wild animals and, and people would just come in and they would steal anything of value. Um, it was just a horrible situation. So Jerusalem was in this situation. Their walls had been torn down. They were, they were just uh, free to, um, to people to attack them, animals, people to steal from them. Uh, so when, when Nehemiah's brother told him this, ne- Nehemiah was heartbroken. He was heartbroken of what had happened to his city of Jerusalem. And I want to pick up the story in the first chapter of of Nehemiah. And the first thing is seeing a need. Nehemiah saw a need. When he heard this, this 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 is Nehemiah's response. He's talking about his brother here, Nehemiah. He said, they said to me, things are not going well for those who return to the providence of Judah. They are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem had been torn down and the gates have been destroyed by fire. When I heard this, I sat down and wept. In fact, for days, I mourned, I fasted, and I prayed to God in heaven. How long has it been since you have wept for the condition of your city? How long has it been since you have prayed and fasted and mourned for people who don't know Jesus that are not here this morning and that are out there doing who knows what right now? They just don't know him. They have no idea who he is. They have no idea how, he, how he's applicable to their life today. How long has it been, and I'm talking to some of you church folks this morning, how long has it been, if ever, have you prayed And fasted and mourned for your city. After finding out about Jerusalem's ruin, Nehemiah mourned. He fasted. He prayed for several days. The thought of it wrecked him. It wrecked him. His mourning shows us something important. And it's this, this morning. If we can't name the problem, if we can't fix the problem, sometimes... Step one is just being honest and addressing it. I read this quote this week, and it's so true. If our, pay attention to this. If our church ignores the problems that are happening in our community, and I would even say our world, we forfeit the right to have any influence in our community. If we ignore it, the problems that are happening in our world and our community... As a church, as, as church people, we forfeit any right that we have to have any kind of influence out there. And it's okay to expect a miracle. Oh, I'm going to pray, and that's great. We can pray and ask God to do things and to change the heart of our, our country and to change the heart of men and women in our community and change the heart of people that are doing un- crazy things. And we're gonna, in the next couple of weeks, we're going to talk about um, uh, communication. And uh, I think sometimes we hear things. We hear like, well, why in the world would they do that? We don't understand why people do certain things. And I tell you what, it, it's okay to pray and ask God to help change that and to change the hearts of men. But it, and it's okay to expect a miracle, but it's absolutely not okay to wait for one. You hear me? We can expect God to do a miracle, but we just can't sit here on our blue puffy chairs and just wait for it. Nehemiah didn't. He immediately started action. I want to remind you that he quickly moved. He expected God to show up. He prayed and fasted, but he didn't stop there. I'm going to continue with the story. Nehemiah was a cupbearer, not a priest. He wasn't a spiritual leader. He wasn't a pastor. He wasn't some high official. But your responsibility has nothing to do with your profession. It has everything to do with your provision. Your responsibility has nothing to do with your profession. It has everything to do with your provision. Each and every one of you here this morning have been provided a gift by God to do something and to serve in some form or fashion. I don't know what that looks like for you. But I'm telling you, it is not about what you do today, what kind of job you have, how qualified you think you are, or how qualified you think you aren't. It's about using and tapping into the provision that God has created innately in every single one of you. 
Are you sitting on your provision? Are you sitting on what God has gifted you with, or are you using it? Nehemiah's story implies that when we do something together, it has potential to to affect how a generation sees God. The second thing you have to do, my second point, I'm going to go through real quickly because I want to give you time after the service here. The second thing is, my second point, you ready for it? You got to risk it for the biscuit. That's my second point. Nehemiah heard what was happening in Jerusalem, knew that he had to do something, but he had this obligation with the king. He was the cupbearer. He was the only guy that the king trusted. Like, if he leaves, who's going to drink the wine and test that? You know, <laughs> oh, hey, the king wants him there. He needs him there. Here's what, he, here's what happens. Early the next morning in the month of Nisan, I don't know why it's not Toyota, but it was Nisan, During the 12th year of King Xerxes' reign, I was serving the king his wine. I had never before appeared sad in his presence. So Nehemiah is heartbroken. He's been crying. He's been fasting. He's been weeping and praying for his friends and family that are out in Jerusalem that are just under attack. He appears before the king. He's heartbroken and sad. The king sees that. He's worried about it because he's like, hey, I've I've always been this happy guy. I always put on the happy face when I go in front of the king, kind of like what we do when we come to church, right? We put on, okay, I'll stop there. Uh, So the king asked me, why are you looking so sad? You don't look sick to me. You must be deeply troubled. Duh. And then I love Nehemiah's next words. Then I was terrified. <laughs> Have you ever been there when it comes to serving? If not, show up at Youth Loop and I'll let you teach a message to a bunch of high school kids. You will be terrified. I would be terrified to go back there in the preschool room. <laughs> terrifying thought of it. But I don't know if God's ever called you to do something that absolutely scares you to death. That's what he was telling Nehemiah to do. He said, Then I was terrified. But I replied, Long live the king. How can I not be sad? For the city where my ancestors are buried is in ruins, and the gates have been destroyed by fire. The king asked, and, and the king asked the question that, that I've been wanting to hear all along. The king, he just asked, Nehemiah asked, and the king said, here it is. How can I help you? Isn't that awesome? So I'm asking you. Our city. Kids. High school kids, preschool kids, junior high kids, adults, seniors, people all over this city need to hear about Jesus. So I'm asking you to help. And I'm hoping you'll answer like the king did. Well, how can I help you? Because we are God's people. Sometimes we are called to leverage what you have. Nehemiah had the trust of the king. He had influence. His life was pretty good. It was comfortable. He knew he couldn't stay there. He saw his shot and he took it. And in this moment, Nehemiah, I want you to know, in that moment that he asked the king, that's why he was terrified. He risked everything. His privilege, his position, his power. Do you know why he did that? Because people are important. People are important. And when you get a vision of what it means to pour and to be a follower of Jesus Christ and to love people like Jesus did and to pour into their lives and put a set aside your comfort and what, oh, I just, I'm not, I'm not wired that way. You know what? It's scary when you decide to serve in some form or fashion on a consistent basis. When you decide to get off of your blue puffy and stop expecting a miracle and just start doing something, you can still expect a miracle, and God does them all the time in people's lives. We saw it today. But we can't just sit around and wait for it. I'm going to hurry real quick. My second point is this. For a second, my second point was you got to risk it for the biscuit. 
Third point is this. If you're sitting here, and I know some of you are sitting here going, well, Trent, you know, on the back wall here, we've got all of these jobs that we need help with around the church. Volunteers, it's a, it's a struggle. You can see them back there. It's a little laid up. Some of you are sitting here going, I can't possibly do that. I can't possibly do, I can't possibly serve in any kind of fashion. I just don't have time. I don't have, I don't have the skill set. What if I have to talk to somebody about Jesus? I don't even really like kids. Uh, high school kids scare me or junior high kids scare me or, or whatever it is. I want you to remind you, my, my third point is this, fake it till you make it. <laughs> okay. Nehemiah, if you read Nehemiah in chapter three, I want to read a couple of scriptures and I'm going to butcher these names. Okay, real quick. Then Elishib, the high priest, and the other priests started to, re- to rebuild the sheep gate. That's, that's verse 1. Verse 3. The fish gate was built by the son of Hanan Hassan. Excuse me. <laughs> verse 4. Merimoth, the son of Uriah and grandson of Had, you got it, Has, 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 repaired the next section of the wall. Verse 6, the old city gate was repaired by Jodiah, son of Pesea, Meshulam, son of Besodea. That's pretty good. I think I did pretty well. The point is, if you read, I want you to go home and read through chapter 3 of Nehemiah. Verse after verse after verse after verse. I could have went on and on. Verse after verse after verse after verse. When they went to the city of Jerusalem, Nehemiah asked the king, hey, I want to go rebuild the city. The king gave him supplies, let him go. And he got to the city of Jerusalem and he started gathering people around him. And he said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to rebuild these city walls and and we're going to do this. And here's how we're going to do it. Joe and you and your sons are going to do this gate. And Bob and and Janice and you and your sons are going to do this. And all through chapter 3, you read... Verse after verse after verse of different people who were working on some kind of job in rebuilding the city walls. It's such an incredible story. It would be so cool if we could just say, we're going to take this community for Salem. We're going to line it up. And here's how we're going to do it. You and you are going to do this. And you and you are going to do this. And you know what? Were they skilled craftsmen? No. Did they know what they were doing? No. Were they fighting battles? Yes. Literally, people were coming and attacking them. They were laying brick with one hand and shooting arrows with another. That's what, I mean, read the story. And in 52 days... Five, two, 52 days, this group of uneducated, unqualified, unskilled people rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem. And we can accomplish the same. But we are better together, and we need your help. Three things happened once the Jerusalem walls were built. Here's what happened. Skeptics on the outside of the wall changed what they believe about God. It says so in Nehemiah 6. So on October 2nd, that's what it says in the Bible, the wall was finished. Just 52 days after it had begun, when our enemies and surrounding nations heard about it, they were frightened and humiliated. They realized that this work had been done by the help of our God. The skeptics outside of the walls changed what they believed about God. Do you think we can accomplish that? Absolutely. Second thing that happens is those inside the walls changed how they listened to God. It says this, he faced the square just inside the water gate from early morning until noon, and he read aloud to everyone who could understand, and all of the people listened closely to the book of the law. It changed the way us, people inside the wall, heard what God was telling us. Third thing, it changed a generation. It changed a generation in how they worshiped God. Nehemiah 8, 17. From the days of the Joshua, son of Nun, until the day the Israelites had not celebrated like this, and their joy was great. He worked together. See, when we work together, we can change. I I, I just believe it. I believe if you and I and all of us work together, we can change how a generation sees the church. Because right now they don't see it very good. But we're working really hard to change that here. We want to be a place where unchurched people can come in here with all of their junk and all of their, all of their nonsense. And we don't look down at them and we don't dress up in our fancy pants. If you do, that's okay. But it's not about like, hey, let's see how great we are and you are. Let's just love people. And we do that 
through serving. And one of the greatest things that you can do to strengthen your walk with Christ is find a place to serve consistently and do it. I don't care if you think you're good at it. I don't care if you're really bad at it. Just do something. Find a place to serve. Get engaged. I don't care if it's holding a, you know, one of, the, one of the jobs that we have here at church, and inside your bulletin, you have this little paper inside your bulletin that has all of the jobs that we need help with. There's all kinds of places that you can plug in and begin to serve here. One of the jobs I people love around here is um, it, it's like holding a sign in the parking lot. <laughs> People love the parking lot, right? Where are my parking lot peeps back there? You know, they're like, we love the parking lot. You know, find a place because it will change. You know, I've always said this, and I'm, I'm, I'm done after this, I promise. I know it's serious. Have you, ever, have you ever gone to, who, raise your hand if you've gone to a party that was at somebody else's house. Raise your hand. We've all been. Were you stressed out over that? Not really. Raise your hand if you've ever hosted a party at your house and you had a bunch of people coming. Or you stressed out over that? It's different. See, it's different. Church will feel different. It's like hosting a party. It's like on Sunday morning, you're like, oh, man, we're ready for them. Let's, I, you know, we're prepared. It feels totally different than if you're just showing up to the party and going, okay, I'm here for the party. Are you just here for the party? Or are you here to serve and to be connected and help us join me on this journey? Join the others that are teaching your kids on Sunday morning. We need desperate help on Sunday morning for somebody. We ask that you would really, that's why we have two services. You can serve in one and come to the other one. <laughs> All right? It's not that much. But I'm going to challenge you this morning. I'm going to ask Ella to come up and uh, wrap us up this morning. But uh, thank you for being here this morning.